This is Math 142. We're going to look at section 10.5, and it's going to be about conics, uh, conic sections in polar coordinates. And conic sections are, are, are sections of cones. So if I grab a cone, think about that as a cone, you can think about cutting it in cross sections in different ways. Like if I cut it in a cross section like this, I get a parabola. Or if I cut it across this way, that's looking through the cones, so I get an ellipse. And if I cut it so it kind of touches both of the pieces of the cone, that's supposed to be straight, I get um, what looks like a hyperbola. What is a hyperbola? So I have these three basic uh, conic shapes that I can talk about. Um, I have parabolas. We know they look like this. Or they could be sideways like that. Um, I also have ellipses. They're like more rounded kind of a squish circle ish thing although circle is an ellipse uh, it's it's much better than that it's much more symmetrical than that and then we also have hyperbolas and you've seen all these before and hyperbola looks like a parabola but it isn't quite as tight and they can go up and down or left and right and they usually have two branches we're just going to focus on one branch today so we have all these different shapes and there's different ways to um, define these shapes you know like you may have seen an ellipse where you have two foci and if you uh, any point that when you add this distance to that distance is a constant is the same number will be a point on the ellipse and for hyperbola it's subtracting they have foci out there and then for parabola um, a parabola a real common definition for a parabola is that you have a directrix. So you have uh, a straight line, and you have some point out here, which is called the focus. That's the focus of it. And then um, it's the collection of points that are equidistant from both this directrix, this line, and this point, this focus. So parabolas uh, wrap around the focus, and we know that any point that's on here if I measure this distance, which I'll call distance 2, and I measure this distance straight across from there, I'll call it distance 2. Uh, sorry, I'll call it distance 1. They're equal to each other. So any point that's on here, the distance from the directrix to the focus is the same. They're the same. And so that's one way that we could define um, a parabola. We're going to take advantage of that definition. So what we will talk about this as in, in the case of the parabola, um, distance one is equal to distance two. And what we'll start to define is what's called the eccentricity of the shape. And you can think of the e eccentricity as this distance, distance two, divided by distance one. In other words, the distance from the focus to a point on the shape divided by a distance from that same point on the shape to the directrix. So I'll just say it's d2 divided by d1. And in the case of the parabola, that is that eccentricity is equal to 1. And it's called an eccentricity because it's measuring um, basically how far from round this shape is. Uh, a circle has an eccentricity of 0 because uh, it doesn't have any, any, it has an infinite number of lines of symmetry. So if the eccentricity ends up being zero, we have a perfect circle. But a parabola with an eccentricity of one is a little bit, um, is, is a ways away from a circle. Now notice if I throw an ellipse, if I wrap an ellipse around this focus, so there's a foci for an ellipse. Notice that distance two is uh, less than that distance one, right? Like any, anything that I put in here where I go, this distance and compare it to that distance. Distance two is going to be less than distance one. So for an ellipse, the eccentricity, smaller number divided by a bigger number, is between zero and one. And hopefully that makes sense to you too, because an ellipse is closer to a circle than a parabola, right? Like if you have a perfect circle, um, it's eccentricity of zero, and then we get these measures like one half, well, you know, one third, one half, and those are getting more and more squished out like this is this is kind of stretching out this way and opening up and then when we hit where they're equal to each other it actually opens up it doesn't have enough curvature to close up and it becomes a parabola 
And if we go a little further than that even, if we grab uh, some points that are like in here, we get to get part of a, a hyperbola. And for these hyperbolas, this distance 2 is bigger than this distance 1. So when the eccentricity is greater than 1, uh, we get a hyperbola. And the hyperbola would have another branch over here as well, but that's all right. So these are things to know about this, this eccentricity. If it's between 0 and 1, you know, close to 0, it's an ellipse because that's close to a 0. As this thing gets more ex eccentric away from a circle, uh, more curved more away from round it, when E hits 1, it becomes a parabola and it blossoms open into hyperbola. For any E value greater than 1, it's going to be a hyperbola out here. And uh, really big values for E, you know, really eccentric shapes, are going to start to look like straight lines, but they're just these really big curves. And something to, to research if you're all interested in um, astronomy, these describe uh, really roughly gravity patterns. Like um, if you have something that goes like this, this is an orbit, right, around something, or you have... A parabola that has, um, you know, that goes like this. It only comes through once or comes through twice. Planets will do this. Regular comets will do this. Comets are meteors that, are, you know, things that only come through once will do a shape like this or a shape like this around that gravity sink, around that sun gravity sink. Something to Google if you're interested in it. Uh, notice we have this line of symmetry for each of these shapes going this way, and that directrix is perpendicular to it. And I want to point out, this whole thing could be going the other direction. In other words, it doesn't have to be left and right. Uh, it could be going up and down, right? So we could have some shapes like this or like this, and our directrix would be flat if that were the case. And that's actually, we have these two different cases that work for us. So we've got these, um, these measurements for the eccentricity. And now I'm going to throw some formulas up here that will help us um, think about the graphs. When, when is a graph going to be an ellipse? When is it going to be a parabola? When is it going to be a hyperbola? A hyperbola. <laughs> so notice we have uh, two different equations here. R equals uh, EP over 1 plus or minus E cosine, and then blah, blah, over 1 over sine. And a couple things to notice here. E is the eccentricity. So that helps us knowing what type of shape it is. And P is, uh, tells us where the directrix is at. And the only difference here, notice, is that one is E cosine theta and the other is E sine theta. And, um, well, it tells us about the direction they're going to go. So cosine, the thing we know about cosine is cosine is X, right? It, it's like left and right. So this shape will be symmetrical in the XY, in the XY direction. Uh, sorry, in the x direction, in the left-right direction. So, for example, um, the directrix is going to be vertical, and then all the shapes, if it, it's an ellipse, oh, that's horrible. Or a parabola, or a hyperbola, right, they're all symmetrical in that direction. So the directrix is going to go up and down, and the shapes, their symmetry is going to be left-right, associated with, sine, with cosine. And uh, sine, up-down, it just goes the other way. Its, uh, its line of symmetry is going to be up-down, and the directrix is going to be horizontal. So there's the directrix right there, whether it's a parabola or hyperbola or an ellipse. So, like I said, E is the eccentricity. P, that P value, tells me where the directrix is at. And so notice since my directrix is going up down, this would be x equals something, right? Like if x equals 5, it has a left-right direction of 5, and it goes up down. x is always 5. Well, y can be all these values. So in this case, uh, if it's a cosine, my directrix would be x equals, and the plus or minus matches whatever this plus or minus is, the p-value. And in this case, the directrix... Over here is horizontal, so it's, it's at a certain height. So it is y equals, again, the plus or minus matches what's here. So there we've got a bit of information. We know how to find the eccentricity if it's in this form and the p-value. So in, in the assignment set for today, 
I'm going to give you some problems and I want you to find the eccentricity and then explicitly state what type of shape it is. So if you know the eccentricity, you know what type of shape it is. Uh, and then also tell where the directrix would be. And one thing to notice is these general equations right here, they are in a certain form, right? There's, there's always a, a 1 here, like 1 plus. So if it doesn't come in that form, we're going to have to manipulate it to get it into that form. So here's three different equations. Notice they're in polar, right? We have a, a radius um, and a theta and an angle. And I want to know what type of shape they are, what their eccentricity is, and where their directrix would be at. So first thing I notice is the general form is this is a plus 1. This is a plus 1. So my manipulation on these... It's going to be to make that into a 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both the top and the bottom by 1 third. So notice if I rewrite this, I still have the R. Uh, 6 times 1 third is 2. 3 times a third is 1. I'm distributing that in here. I wanted that to happen. Plus 2 times a third is 2 thirds. Sine theta. So I know my E. I know my eccentricity is right there is 2 thirds. And then let's see, e times p equals 2. So that means that uh, 2 thirds times p is equal to 2. However you want to solve that, you can see, you can see that p is 3. So now I know, I know all my pieces here. I know the eccentricity is 2 thirds. So it must be an ellipse. And p equals 3. And this is plus. So either x or y is going to equal 3. And since this is sine, and this kind of helps too, sine is y, y equals 3. That's my directrix. Let's do the same thing with these, with these next ones. So this isn't a 1, so I want it to be a 1. So I'm going to divide everything by 4, right? Both top and bottom. So when I do that, uh, this makes this a 3. This makes this a 1. This makes this a 5 fourths and it's cosine of theta. So notice 1 plus or minus, yep, e cosine of theta, so e must be 5 fourths. That's bigger than 1, so it's very eccentric, right? It's further away from a circle, so it's a hyperbola. It's cosine, so uh, my directrix is going to be x is equal to some version of p. I also know that e times p is the numerator, so e times p is 3. So 5 fourths times p is equal to 3. And what I do here is I'd multiply both sides by 4 fifths. And I can multiply this by 4 fifths. Multiply this by 4 fifths. So p must equal 12 fifths. So if p equals 12 fifths, that helps me think about where my uh, directrix would be. Uh, since it's cosine, it's x equals, since this is plus, it's plus 12 fifths. All right. And, you know, this one, hopefully you can do this one as well. One thing to notice, this is minus. So your directrix would be, since it's sine, y equals negative, whatever that is. Let's go the opposite direction. In other words, I'm going to give you the information, and then we will write the equation from it. Uh, so the directrix is x equals 15, and e is one third. So if the directrix the directrix directrix tells us the the uh, the p value, right? P is 15, and e is one third. So let's think about this then. Oh, and since it's x equals cosine x, it must be this version of it. So let's let's write what we got. So e times p goes in the numerator. E times p that's five. 1, that's positive, so plus the eccentricity, 1 third, and again, this was x equals cosine. So that's pretty good. Uh, I really shouldn't leave that, that fraction there, so I'm going to multiply everything by 3 to get rid of that fraction. So this would be 15 over 3 plus 1 third times 3 is 1, cosine of theta.
Let's give this one a go. Uh, y equals 3 and E equals 3. So that means that P is 3, E is 3, and we know that it's Y equals, and sine, it correlates with Y. So it's this equation, and that's positive, so it's going to be plus. So let's see, R equals uh, E times P, so 9 over 1, plus the eccentricity is 3, and then since it's Y equals, it's sine. And that is done. I'm going to do one more example like this that has uh, some fractions in it for us to mess around with. So the directrix is at y equals negative uh, 4, and the eccentricity is 3 halves. 3 halves is bigger than 1. This will be a hyperbola, right, because it's more eccentric. Um, y is negative, okay, so it's going to have a, a minus in the bottom. I'm just kind of gathering up what I know here. Um, the top is this times that. So let's see. And I'm not going to pick up the negative. The negative is taken care of down here. I'm just going to say 4 times 3 halves. That's 12 halves, uh, which is 6. The eccentricity of 3 halves. E goes here. And then this is y equals. Y goes with sine. Sine theta. And I have that. I really shouldn't leave this compound fraction in here. So I'm just worried about the 2. I'm going to multiply everything by 2, right? I'm going to multiply both the top and the bottom by 2. It gets distributed into the denominator. It just goes on here. So I'm going to say r is equal to 6 times 2 is 12. 2 times 1 is 2 minus 3 halves times 2 is 3. Sine theta. And there it is. Take a look at these problems. Get that practice in. Message me with any questions or post them in the forum.